Yep, it's time to discuss You Can't Do That on Television. It was zany, rebellious, and vulgar. But above all, it was very Canadian. This children's sketch show put Nickelodeon on the map and lasted from 1979 to 1990, with a cast of children performing many oddball comedy skits, making it feel like a show made by kids for kids, and its child audience couldn't get enough of it. But of course, there's the main thing that everyone remembers the show for, the slime. Lots and lots of slime. This show had so much slime it was insane, and pretty awesome. It would also include many memorable characters, and feature kids in school lockers telling jokes. And once again, lots of slime. Look, I can't underestimate just how much slime there was in this show, and the impact that that slime had on pop culture. So what exactly was it about you can't do that on television that got kids addicted to it? How and why did it become compulsive viewing? Well, today we are going to try and discover that by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about you can't do that on television. So, let's check it out or I'll cry. Let's do this. Number 10, The Anti-Educational Kids Show. Despite its heavy association with Nickelodeon, You Can't Do That on Television originally wasn't a Nickelodeon production. It was the creation of British TV producer Robert Price. By the late 70s, he had already created several children's television shows, including the British children's science fiction series The Tomorrow People, as well as the British children's comedy shows You Must Be Joking and You Can't Be Serious, which honestly both look and feel very similar to You Can't Do That on Television, as they both have the same energy, and they can almost be seen as an early prototype or as I like to call them, you can't do that on television, the British versions. In 1979, he was commissioned by a local TV station in Ottawa, Canada to create a kids show, originally just intended to be a local show. Price had envisioned a comedy sketch show for kids, but one solely made for kids, starring kids, feeling as if the show could have even been made by kids, which led to the creation of You Can't Do That on Television. He had one major guideline though, he didn't want it to feel like an educational program, of which kids shows tended to be back in those days. Nope, despite education being important, he wanted the school books left at the door for this one, and for You Can't Do That on Television, to be purely about fun. The hour-long episodes were filmed on a very low budget. The original season would consist of comedy sketches often performed live, as well as added features, like musical acts, and competitions where kids could win prizes, making it feel more like a kids' variety show, unlike the sketch show which it would later become. You Can't Do That on Television felt manic, weird, and random, and like anything could literally happen. So naturally, its targeted child audience loved it. Sadly, not many episodes of that first season exist anymore. However, some have been uploaded to YouTube. Number 9. Influences The show's title of You Can't Do That on Television was supposedly influenced by legendary comedian George Carlin's Seven Words That You Can't Say on Television sketch. Well, according to Joe Blow. Now, I would say what those seven words are, but you can't do that on YouTube. <laughs> See what I did there? So if you're curious, just look, just Google it. Rest assured though that they are some pretty naughty words. The series intro was inspired by the cut and paste animation style of Terry Gilliam, particularly his work on Monty Python's Flying Circus. And given you can't do that on television's creator Roger Price's English background, it'll make sense that he would be a fan of Monty Python and would want to pay homage and create his own Python-esque style intro. Be that one aimed at kids. The titles are great, but I always got freaked out by the titles being plastered on Les Lies' face. 
Is it just me or does he look like he has some really bad jaundice going on? And of course, there's the show's bombastic theme song. This is actually a classical piece of music, known as the William Tell Overture, which was originally composed by musician Gioacchino Rossini, all the way back in 1829. Yep, here I was thinking that it was some zany music made for the show, but nope, it was a classical piece of music. <laughs> I'd like to pretend I know something about Rossini and his music, but honestly I don't. So, there. Number 8. Nickelodeon really wanted to do that on television. Now after the broadcast of the first season of You Can't Do That on Television, the show had become popular and was in demand. The show made leaps and bounds from being a local TV show to a national one on CTV, in which the show was re-edited, with the musical acts and other local content removed, as well as a laughter track added, with the show being compacted to a half an hour slot, where the show was now retitled to Whatever Turns You On. However, American children's cable network, Nickelodeon, was starting to take notice of You Can't Do That on Television. Just like you can't do that on television, Nickelodeon was launched in 1979 and was looking for children's programming to help give the network some gravitas and put it on the map. Roger Price and director Jeffrey Darby were contacted by Nickelodeon where they got involved and edited some episodes from the 1981 season of You Can't Do That on Television and once again condensed them into half an hour episodes. Where the show premiered on Nickelodeon in 1982 and was a huge hit with You Can't Do That on Television becoming Nickelodeon's highest rated series and launched it into the popular TV zeitgeist and no doubt was the network's big break and made Nickelodeon the hit that it is today. Nickelodeon would even become partners with You Can't Do That on Television's production, where more episodes were produced, with this new 1980s era of the show being considered as You Can't Do That on Television's peak years, where the show would go on from being a one-week-an-episode show to being broadcast every day. So although You Can't Do That on Television started off as a show, which by design was very Canadian, it would go on to find huge success on American TV. Number 7. Slime, Slime and More Slime So of course we were going to get there sooner or later. The Slime. Yep, the first thing that anyone thinks of when they think of this show. The hurdles of green slime being poured all over these kids' heads. One thing is for certain, this show had plenty of slime. So if slime is your thing, then you can't do that on television is your holy pinnacle of happiness. The slime actually came to be by accident. In the early days, there was this one sketch in particular with a kid who was in a dungeon who was told not to pull on a chain, where of course he pulls the chain and sewerage was to pour on him. In order to create the sewerage, director Jeffrey Darby went to the studio's cafeteria in order to get some leftover bits of food scrapes from people's plates and to put all the food scrapes into a bucket with the intention to film that scene and to have the leftover bits of food poured all over this kid. But filming that day had to stop due to the time frame legal requirements when it came to filming with children. So the bucket that was full of all the old food scrapes was put aside. Filming then commenced the following week, and the food in the bucket had putrefied and grew mold where it became a disgusting green sludge, and the crew didn't have enough time to get a new bucket of leftovers. So to everyone's amazement, Darby insisted on pouring the bucket on this poor kid's head anyway, where instead of leftover food which was designed to look like sewerage, the kid had green sludge poured all over him. This started a very popular trend in the show of green slime being poured onto the young performers whenever they say, I don't know, as well as water being poured on them whenever someone says water. This proved so iconic and successful, Nickelodeon would use the green slime gimmick in many of its other shows. In fact, the green slime gimmick is part of the Nickelodeon landscape, and even to this day, people are still getting slimed, including celebrities. Yep, it seems that when it comes to Nickelodeon, no one is safe from having a heap of green goop splattered all over them. And to think it came from a bucket of rotten food. Number six. Filming at kid-friendly hours. You Can't Do That on Television was filmed at CJHO TV Studios, Ottawa, in Ontario, Canada. 
The production behind the show, particularly director Jeffrey Darby, cared greatly about the child cast and wanted to make sure that they led normal lives and got a good education. So to accommodate this, filming would take place after school hours. According to Darby, he never wanted the show to interfere with the children's education. So the kids would go to the studio on afternoons after school hours on weekdays, where they would do readings for upcoming episodes, and then they would come back for the weekends to film their scenes, ensuring that they still led normal, healthy lives. In fact, the child actors would get bonuses every time they either got slimed or drenched in water. For having water dropped on them, they would get an extra $75, and the going rate for having slime dropped on them was $150 extra. Director Darby added that this was a way of rewarding the kids for the horrors that they had to experience with the slime and water. Although, often if you look at the footage, it looks as though the kids are actually really loving having all that slime dunked on them. But that could be because they're thinking about how many Snickers bars they can buy with $150 or something like that, you know what I mean. Number 5. The cast did that on television. Over the course of the show's 11-year run, over 100 kids would star in You Can't Do That on Television. As the show was mainly set around a child to pre-teen cast, this meant that through the show's run, there were kids coming and going. Now, the cast did include some adult actors, including Canadian actor and comedian Les Lye, who featured in every single episode, playing a variety of different characters. Here's what I remember the most about the show, especially the Bath character, who I always thought looked kind of creepy thanks to his darkened eyes. Ugh. That and the fact that he's playing a chef called Bath. Yeah, no eating up what he's preparing. Despite being in the business since the 60s, You Can't Do That on Television earned him great acclaim and recognition. Likewise, Canadian actress, voice artist and comedian Abby Haggyard would also feature in the show as a variety of characters when she joined the cast in 1982. One thing that always stood out to me as a kid is her glorious, ginormous red hair. By the way, she also did voice work on Care Bears, so there's that. When it comes to the child actors on the show, the one that people remember the most was Christine McGlade, who hosted the show with the main focus often being put on her, along with her getting the nickname Moose, which was actually a nickname that she had in real life. She was the third longest starring member of the cast, having appeared in 91 episodes. Just like the slime, her involvement in the show was accidental. She showed up to auditions to support a friend who was auditioning. The show's creator and producer Robert Price noticed her and told her to either audition or leave. So she did an audition and it must have been a pretty good audition as she was immediately cast. And in addition to that, in 1986, a very young, itty-bitty Alanis Morissette was also part of the child cast, where nine years later, she would reach huge heights of success thanks to her album, Jagged Little Pill. So... Alanis Morissette was told that she couldn't do that on television, so she went and did it in music instead. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? Yeah, look, I'm sorry, I had to, I had to say that and just get it out of my system. Number four, banned episodes. Despite the fact that You Can't Do That on Television had a reputation of using gross-out and anti-establishment humour, which paved the way for other potty humour TV shows on Nickelodeon, like Ren and Stimpy, it seemed that some episodes may have gone a little too far. In 1984, there was an episode called Divorce, which ended up being banned in Canada, as it was felt that it was making fun of a serious and sensitive topic. That, of course, being divorced. Then in 1987, there was an episode called Adoption. In one skit in particular, a child is adopted because it was considered cheaper than buying a dog. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not laughing. <coughs> Stop it! You're laughing, not me! The episode was aired in America. But after its broadcast, it was decided to never show the episode in the US ever again, with a label reading, Do Not Air, being put on the master tape. Series director Jeffrey Darby would go on to admit that they went a little too far with that episode, as none of the kids who starred in the show were adopted, and no one who worked on the show knew anyone who was adopted. So they weren't really privy to the issue, and thus they didn't know the buttons that they were pushing when it came to the topic of adoption. Oh well, what do you know? I guess you can't do that on television after all. 
Number three, failed spin-off. In 1985, due to the huge popularity of You Can't Do That on Television, Nickelodeon asked series creator Roger Price to create another similar sketch show, where he came up with Turkey Television. The main focus on the show was a cartoon turkey character called Thurman T. Turkey, who would go around the world to film television shows from other countries. Turkey Television had skits similar to You Can't Do That on Television, as well as clips from cartoons from around the world, as well as clips from comedy series like Monty Python, as well as Weird Al music videos. Turkey Television also featured many regulars from You Can't Do That on Television, including Lee Lai and Christine McLeod. The show wasn't as successful and didn't make it past its first season. It's said that at the time of filming, McGlade was in her early 20s and now wanted to move on to other pastures awaiting her in life. And so for Turkey Television, she also served as a producer on the show. After leaving You Can't Do That on Television the following year in 1986, she continued to work as a producer as well as a director and writer, where she would go on to be a digital designer. So although Turkey Television didn't take off, it still helped to push her career further into what it would become in her adult years. Number 2. Backlash According to Mental Floss, there were many people who weren't fans of the show, particularly parents who didn't like the way the adults were portrayed in the show. I'm guessing this is because of the show's anti-establishment vibe, which often had this feel of kids versus adults. But, meh, I say it's just a TV show, get over it. It seems that someone else who didn't like the show and thought that it gave off the wrong messages was Mr. Rogers himself. According to an article on TheAtlantic.com, when talking about the careful way Fred Rogers spoke to kids, it's explained that, quote, he insisted that every word, whether spoken by a person or puppet, be scrutinized closely, because he knew that children, the preschool age boys and girls, who made up the core of his audience, tend to hear things literally. So maybe this idea of careful scrutinizing when it came to how to address children may have been his biggest issues with You Can't Do That on Television, which is more manic and over the top, and utterly ridiculous, in a brilliant way. You Can't Do That on Television's creator Robert Price just flat out put it out there when he said, Fred Rogers hated the show. But he defended You Can't Do That on Television by adding that he and Mr. Rogers are basically saying the same thing. Only Mr. Rogers is saying it to four-year-olds, and he, Price, is saying it to eight-year-olds. And that he does care about his child viewers and who they are, as opposed to what their parents may want them to be. Now this is kind of interesting, as although you can't do that on television and Mr. Rogers' Neighbourhood may be worlds apart, as you can't do that on television was wild and vulgar, and Mr. Rogers was more pure and wholesome, maybe the two shows weren't that different after all, and that underneath their aesthetics they had the same message. Number 1. Cancellation Despite being a hugely successful TV show that put Nickelodeon on the map, things started to sour in the later 80s. The show was suspended in 1988, with Roger Price being informed that Nickelodeon didn't want to order any more episodes of You Can't Do That on Television, so he left Canada and travelled to France. When he returned to Canada, he was looking into making more episodes of You Can't Do That on Television, where Nickelodeon must have had some change of heart, as they did order more episodes for a 1989 season. So the show was back on track. Sadly though, many fans of You Can't Do That on Television were somewhat split when it came to the new episodes that featured in 1989 and 1990. It was felt that there was now more of an over-reliance on the slime and gross-out gags, making it lose a certain something that the show once had. This led to a ratings decline, but the final nail in the coffin of the show was Nickelodeon wanted to produce more shows that they solely owned, and they wanted to do so at their at the time new studio at Universal Studios in Florida. And so just like that, in 1990, the show which once gave so many kids so much joy came to an abrupt end. Well, it wasn't entirely the end as Nickelodeon would air repeats of the show till 1994. There was a reunion special called Project 131 that was broadcast on CJOH TV in 2004. There were attempts to reboot the show in 2017, but the attempts fell through. As time has gone by, You Can't Do That on Television has been regarded as something sacred, something that brought so much joy to so many people's childhoods. 
Something that still gives us child viewers wonderful great memories well into their adulthoods. It was wacky, zany, crazy, gross and very Canadian. It seems to really communicate with the kids and reach out to them on another level that not many other children's media are able to do. It may have been a rebellious TV show full of toilet humour, it was still a show that had so much love. And even to this day, the love that people have for this show won't be dying down anytime soon. I think the fact that the show was able to communicate with kids on their level was part of its huge success. And I think it's a shame that it came to an abrupt end like that, as I do think the show still had many more years left in it. But, you know what they say, all good things must come to an end. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I can't think of anything else to say, so I'll just say Bath. Yep, Bath and his scary eyes. Ugh. See ya!